It is Friday, November the 29th, 2019. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff and Georgia. On today's show, no special corner in my heart, the lynching of Leo Frank. And we'll talk a little bit about the experience of the Jewish people in the United States of America around the 20th century, specifically in Atlanta. But of course, before I get to all of that, just a brief reminder that today's show, like all of these shows, is brought to you by listeners like you, folks who have gone to patreon.com slash peasant and become recurring donors for as little as $1 a month. You can also make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash dissidentpeasant. There's links to all this at dissidentpeasant.com. Of course, you can check me out on Twitter at Jeff His Dudeness. It's really the only social media that I use with any regularity these days. Of course, yesterday was Thanksgiving in the United States. Not all of my listeners are American. Not all of Americans are into Thanksgiving, but in the general spirit of things, I just want to say I'm very thankful for my audience and supporters. The fact that you exist is amazing to me every day. I very much appreciate your time and your contributions. Once upon a time, August 4th, 1913, to be precise, something amazing happened. A black man named Jim Conley took the stand in a court of law in the state of Georgia and began to give his sworn testimony against a rich white man. He testified that in the pencil factory in which he swept the floors, his boss, the white man on trial here, had asked him to play the lookout for him while he entertained young women in his office, including a 13-year-old girl named Mary. He further testified that after chatting with Mary, his boss had whistled for him, and he said that he and Mary had quarreled and the boss had struck her. Conley said he was sent to get the girl and found her dead. They hid the body together, he said, and he was then told by the boss that there was a great deal of money in it for him if he kept his mouth shut. He then made him write some notes that attempted to implicate another person as the murderer. On largely the basis of his testimony in 1913, with the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan right around the corner in a Georgia still decades away, from even beginning to mandate racial equality in its law and politics, a white man was sentenced to die. But this was no act of justice, no symbol of progress on racism in the United States. For one thing, Jim Conley was full of shit. In fact, in all probability, he was the true murderer of Mary Fagan. For another thing, I said the man sentenced to die was white. Or was he? Whiteness, that ever amorphous blob, in frequent need of reinforcement and reconstitution, stretching and shrinking to serve different needs at different times. It's a word fraught with danger for all who employ it. Leo Frank, the man sentenced to die, looked white. If you had shown people a picture of him then and now, with no other context, and asked, is this dude white? The answer would be overwhelmingly yes, I have no doubt. But Leo Frank was also Jewish, and he will ultimately be killed for a crime he almost certainly didn't commit. Not by the state, but by a lynch mob. This event, at the intersection of changes in immigration, industrialization, race, and justice, captured the nation's attention. And even though it was a famous trial with some truly dramatic twists and turns and an ultimately tragic end, I'd say it's pretty underappreciated by people generally. 
Some legal scholars and historians who focus on the history of the Jewish people in North America aside, not many have zoomed in on the event much, and even fewer have divined any lessons or principles, caught on to any patterns, or teased out much of anything from the event, but that a racist mob can be a terror. But there's more to it than all of that, I'm sure, and it's a good opportunity to talk about many different changes that were happening in Atlanta and the United States generally in the late 19th to early 20th century as our economy became one of machines and the modern world was being born. There's lots of times and places I could begin, but let's go with Russia in 1881. There's a new czar. Alexander III, who, by the grace of God, is also King of Poland and Grand Duke of Finland, don't forget. His father had previously been assassinated, the great Tsar Liberator, and his son's ascension had marked a terrible outbreak of anti-Jewish violence throughout the Russian Empire and wider Eastern Europe, particularly in the lands of current-day Poland and the Ukraine where the Jews were blamed for the death of their beloved Tsar. Worse, the new Tsar permitted and even encouraged these pogroms. And this is around when the word pogrom in English comes into popular use, actually. As a result of this wave of violence, discrimination, and murder, about three million Jews from these places came to the United States over the next 40 years. There were some Jews already living in America. There were Jews here since colonial times, of course. No point in American history has been completely free of anti-Semitism, but as for the city of Atlanta, as the 19th century became the 20th, it was home to one of the most assimilated and respected Jewish communities in America, the largest in the South. These Jews were, and sometimes still are, referred to as German Jews. Though in reality, this wave of Jewish immigration that started around the 1840s came not just from Germany, but also from Bohemia, Austria, and elsewhere. But sure, lots of them spoke German when they came. They mostly practiced reform or else eventually conservative Judaism. And in Atlanta, the Jewish community throughout the 1880s and 1890s openly declared that their situation was among the best of any Jews in America. Now, a few societies and clubs remained restricted. That was code for no Jews at the time. But a number of Jewish-Gentile law partnerships were formed in Atlanta and throughout the South in these years. Four Jews were elected to the Atlanta City Council. They were regularly designated as officers in the Chambers of Commerce, Mason's Lodge. Two Jews were elected to the State House from Atlanta. Generally speaking... Atlanta's Jews mixed widely and easily with society and were pretty well off, and had worked incredibly hard, some of them grumbled too hard, actually, to assimilate and adapt their religious practices to make them as acceptable as possible to the city's Gentile population. The oldest synagogue in Atlanta, and the only one around at the time, usually just called the Temple, had a pipe organ was staunchly anti-Zionist until the 1920s, was against the use of Hebrew in worship, and above all wanted to be both fully Jewish and fully American. But into Atlanta and the United States came these new Jews from the Russian Empire, who mostly anyway spoke Yiddish, were much poorer than their German Jew counterparts, and who were not into Reform Judaism at all. They are mostly Orthodox. And like in much of the United States, anti-Semitism, which had already been on the rise in the nation's politics as a part of the populist movement's rhetoric, began to increase. Now, the mostly wealthy and pretty well-assimilated Jewish population of Atlanta began to openly worry that these new arrivals were a threat to their carefully cultivated place in the world. Words like barbaric, ignorant, and backwards were frequently employed by both the Jewish and Gentile press to describe these new immigrants. Some efforts to help these recently arriving Jews by the established Jewish community of Atlanta did occur, but often they were perceived as patronizing and offensive by the recipients. The Standard Club, organized by wealthy Jews in Atlanta, 
and purchasing a mansion to serve as clubhouse in 1905, didn't stop discriminating against Yiddish-speaking Jews until the 1930s. After Leo Frank, a congregant of the temple, is killed, Rabbi David Marks will lament these recent arrivals as responsible for the tragedy, believing that without their presence, such a thing would never have been possible. Though it shouldn't surprise anyone that most people of prejudice weren't nearly so scrupulous in differentiating between these two groups of Jews. At a time when anti-Semitism was on the rise, even if it was somewhat blunted in Atlanta. What wasn't blunted were the massive changes in Atlanta as the city industrialized. This was the age of Coca-Cola and the railroad, of factories and mills, streetcars, and for the first time, automobiles. You know, progress, as I was taught in school. Well, perhaps it was progress of a sort, but as industry and population swelled in Atlanta during the decades leading up to the killing of Leo Frank, other changes occurred that were less positive. Wages were pitifully low, the work week frequently over 60 hours long, and child labor incredibly common. It's easy enough to appreciate this through a quick review of the young Mary Fagan, just a child when she was killed, but already a veteran of the workforce. She was born to two tenant farmers, but would do no farming herself. She left school when she was 10 to work in a textile mill. From the spring of 1912 until her death, she worked in a pencil factory, making 10 cents an hour, working 55 hours a week. I don't want to romanticize pre-industrial Georgia, of course, but it's also true that these changes represented seismic shifts in society at a time when culture was still strongly patriarchal and focused on rural life. Many of these people believed, with good reason I'd say, that to subject them to such working conditions and spare not even the wives and daughters of the land was degrading and shameful. In 1913, for example, just weeks before Mary Fagan was murdered, a citywide conference on the problem of child labor was held, and at least some of the participants were very interested in pointing out that many of the city's factories that employed child labor were owned by Jews. Into this, Leo Frank entered the picture. He was not a native of Georgia, born in Texas and raised in New York, and moving to Atlanta after college at Cornell in his 20s at the invitation of his uncle, who owned shares in the National Pencil Company. He married a woman from a local Jewish family named Lucille Selig in 1910 and was the superintendent of the factory that Mary Fagan worked at. He became an active member of the community, he liked opera and playing bridge, and it seems to me that even if he wasn't the type to fight to change the world, or get radical in any way, he was a decent enough guy, a family man, despite all that will be said about him during the trial. Certainly no worse than other members of his class who owned a slice of the means of production, even if he did technically manage a factory that relied on child labor and paid like shit. All that being said, Leo Frank is about to get pinned for a murder he didn't commit, largely based on the testimony of the actual murderer. He's the superintendent of a pencil-making factory that pays shit wages and employs child labor, including the labor of young women. It's not very popular, even if it's all illegal. He's not just an outsider to Georgia. He's not just a Yankee. He's a bona fide Brooklyn-raised Yankee. And he's also Jewish to boot, and you know what a problem they've been over the past few years, or so people might put it at the time. But as for us, we are to put on our true crime hats. And it's time for me to give you the nuts and bolts of how he gets pinned for that murder, as best we can tell. And why most people are so sure my man didn't kill anyone at all. On April 26, 1913, Confederate Memorial Day as it happened, Mary Fagan went to the pencil factory to collect her wages, arriving around noon. She was paid a dollar and twenty cents by Mr. Frank, which he admitted to. Her strangled body was found, sans wages, a little after 3 a.m. the next day by a night watchman at the factory named Newt Lee when he went to use the bathroom. And he immediately called the police, terrified that he, a black man, would immediately be fingered as a suspect. 
Newt Lee was immediately fingered as a suspect, along with a few others, but over time, police would come to be convinced that Leo Frank was the murderer. He seemed nervous when questioned by the authorities, and insinuations about his appetite for taking advantage of young women as both a man and a boss were abundant though very little in the way of concrete accusations could be found, and with plenty of people willing to say otherwise. Bizarrely, her body was also found with two notes, written in half gibberish, half English. One read, quote, He said he would, W-O-O-D, love me land down play like the night witch did it, but that long, tall, black negro did boy his slef, S-L-E-F, end quote. The other read, quote, Ma'am, that negro higher down here did this, I went to make water, and he pushed me down that hole, a long, tall, negro, black, that who it was, long, slim, tall, negro, I white, while play with me, end quote. This actually ain't a mystery podcast, plus this particular case is over a hundred years old now, but I don't really think you need for me to actually reveal to you that one, it's exceedingly unlikely the murder victim had the time and opportunity to write these notes, and two, the most likely author of the notes was the murderer themselves. By the way, Night Witch was thought to mean Night Watch, i.e. Night Watchman, i.e. Newt Lee, who really was held in jail for quite a while on suspicion of being involved in the murder. Newt Lee certainly thought someone was trying to frame him and said so, though just who was trying to frame him was unknown to him at the time. Jim Conley was a janitor at the pencil factory, a black man and was arrested a few days after the crime when he was discovered washing some red stains out of his work shirt. He claimed the stains were rust. The police didn't believe him and arrested him before deciding that it was rust. But actually, it was blood. And after being in custody a while, Jim Conley gave his first formal statement that he was drinking and gambling the day of the murder and told the cops he was illiterate. Witnesses placed him at the factory that day, however, and it was later revealed that he was full of shit about being illiterate. In fact, his manner of writing was similar to the writing on the notes found near Mary Fagan, and in time the police got him to admit that he had written the notes, but he said Leo Frank had dictated them to him the day before the murder. His story would continue to change a lot while in police custody, and with an actual history of petty crime and drunkenness, his credibility as a witness should have been virtually nil, but this was a time of immense stress and strain upon rapidly industrializing capitalist Atlanta, of new Jewish immigration to the United States, and of a genuine romanticism for a past that was more rural, more simple, less diverse. Leo Frank's defense team and many of his supporters in the Jewish community in both Atlanta and as publicity gathered nationwide explicitly based their strategy on implicating Jim Connolly as the murderer. Now, I want to be careful here because, well, he almost certainly did do it, with character, opportunity, evidence, and motive all pointing to him as the likely murderer, but he was portrayed in incredibly racist terms as an anarchic, dangerous, degraded, an innately violent man. The prosecution, in contrast, portrayed Jim Conley as a familiar archetype, a simple, hard-working black man who knew to keep his head down and wasn't possibly intelligent enough to just make up such a convoluted story in an attempt to save his skin. Well, Jim Conley was that intelligent because that's exactly what he did. I won't go through the entire trial, which involved consequential evidence of Jim Conley shitting in the elevator shaft of the factory. <laughs> but based on the testimony of this star witness and a coerced statement from the Frank's housekeeper, as well as a bunch of ambiguities and insinuations aplenty in the press and the courtroom about Frank's lust for young women and the possibility that Mary Fagan had been sexually abused either before or after her death, no conclusive evidence of this has ever been produced, I hasten to add. 
The jury, after a very short deliberation of just a few hours, declared Leo Frank guilty. Here is a good place to talk a bit about some of the journalism, so-called anyway, that inflamed the lynching of Leo Frank. I quote now from a portion of a report from The Day Book, Chicago, Saturday, July 17th, 1915, by Carl Sandberg. Because it's a good summation, despite its point of view, of how things went in at least one particular paper, a Hearst paper, the Atlanta Georgian at the time. And it's emblematic of the coverage. Quote, Hearst's Georgian, new to Atlanta, jumped at the Frank case as a chance to build circulation. Mary Fagan was murdered on a Saturday, and the body was found on a Sunday. Hearst Georgian on Monday ran extras all day, fanning the public mind into a condition of delirium. Said Leo Frank was nervous. Frank trembled facing the dead body of Mary Fagan. Frank was not cool like an innocent man. Next day, the whole front page was taken up with a story of how Frank had once been caught in the woods with a little girl. The human nut who had witnessed it posed for his picture printed in the Georgian. The two older newspapers, Journal and Constitution, proved the story a lie. Hearst Georgian admitted two days afterwards it was a lie, in small type, on an inside page. Next on the front page in big type was an affidavit by a sporting woman named Formsby. She swore Frank phoned her the day of the murder to keep a room for him at her house because he had a little girl. The woman afterward took back her story. Hearst stories said Frank was a rich Jew running after Gentile girls. His wife, ready for divorce, sore at her husband, didn't go to see him after his arrest for one week. All these proven lies at trial. With big crowds in Atlanta set on a hair trigger, ready for anything, talking of lynching, Hearst Georgian flashed this story. On the night of the murder of Mary Fagan, Frank would not sleep with his wife, slept on the floor told his wife he was going to kill himself because he had killed a girl. This kicked up some excitement in Atlanta and prejudice. Damn the Jew became a regular street chorus. Other papers showed the story a fake. Hearst Georgian corrected it in small type. Inside page. Another front page story. Reporter for Hearst Georgian finds a boy who says he met Mary Fagan on streetcar the day of the murder and she told him she was going to office of Leo Frank, but was afraid of him because he had made advances to her. Story proven false. Boy since then, sent to state reform school for theft. A bloody shirt, a tangle of hair on a lathe in Frank's pencil factory, and alleged to be Mary Fagan's, and a splash of red on the floor, all were made excuses for Hearst Extras and claims of scoops. Later, all these shown to be plants. City physician at trial testified hair, not Mary Fagan's. The blood was red paint. The bloody shirt was never introduced into evidence. Atlanta was getting wild. The chorus of damn the Jew was rising. They were ready to believe anything about the pencil manufacturer. Some big Hearst headlines. We have sufficient evidence to convict Frank, say detectives. Leo Frank on the grill. Evidence against Frank conclusive, say police. Police say they have Frank in net. Dorsey adds startling evidence of Frank's guilt. Dorsey says Frank is fast in the net. During the 30-day trial of Frank, Hearst had extras out every day. Each day an editor analyzed testimony and shot it full of bitterness against Frank. Because of wild mobs, two other papers asked Judge Rowan to have verdict delayed from Saturday till Monday. Both Frank and Judge Rowan threatened with lynching. Governor had militia ready under arms, ready for call. Frank and his lawyers warned by judge not to come to court. And Hearst Georgian on that day put out 14 extra editions. They were eaten up. It was like feeding a fire with gasoline. Frank was convicted, sentenced to be hanged. Judge Rowan stated from the bench he was, quote, 
not convinced, end quote, of Frank's guilt. Atlanta Journal called it legal murder and asked for a new trial. All the time that a wide clamor was on for fair play for Frank, Hearst Georgian stood pat for hanging the Jew. When Frank's sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, Hearst's northern and western papers let out a loud brag in big black editorials, said Hearst had favored commutation and had so written the governor of Georgia. Not a word of this ever got into Hearst's Georgian. Willie Hearst is a friend of the Jews. Yes, children. Willie the Hearst is a great, great friend of the Jews. He wanted Leo Frank choked dead by a rope around the neck for a murder not proven in fair trial. End quote. After that Atlanta Journal had called for Frank to be given a new trial, another publication run by one Thomas E. Watson made a stunning about face. Without getting too bogged down, Watson's career is a fascinating study in the nature of populism, how it can be both progressive and reactionary. He's definitely about to make a huge step backwards in the reactionary vein. In addition to running his publications and being in politics, Watson was also a well-known defense attorney who opposed the death penalty. And Leo Frank's family had approached him with a substantial sum of money for their legal defense shortly after he was arrested would have been an odd thing for them to do if he had been known as a virulent anti-Semite, even if he was well known as a white supremacist at this time. He turned the family down, but after the Atlanta Journal, which was closely associated with a bitter political rival of Watson's, called for a new trial, his eponymous Watson's Magazine, which had been sensationalist, yes, but only rarely focused on Jews as a people, exploded into a froth. It accused other papers, like the Atlanta Journal, of taking money from rich Jews and Northerners to free a murderer, and directly tied Leo Frank to bitter laments about immigration to America. Just a brief warning, this is pretty anti-Semitic, from something called The Rich Jews Indict a State, dated October 1915, quote, Huge sections of our overgrown cities are as foreign to us as any territory that lies beyond seas. Our laws are powerless in these unassimilated settlements. Little Italy in New York is, to all practical intents and purposes, a section of Naples transported to our shores. Chinatowns in America are miniature cantons. The industrial colonies of West Virginia, Colorado, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey are just that many small Hungaries. Poland's, Germany's, and Italy's. As for the Jews, they have found our asylum a paradise, and from the uttermost ends of the earth they are rushing through our ports. The Zionist societies, financed by the Hirsch Endowment of $45 million, are planning to bring 3 million European Jews here at the close of the present war. So wide open have been the doors of our asylum that the native stock which made the republic is already in the minority. Its relative strength grows less with every shipload of immigrants. Under these torrents of foreign peoples, whole states have lost their original character. Massachusetts is not what she was before the Civil War, nor is Colorado. Puritan New England has been submerged. The hordes from abroad are in possession. They fill the shops, the quarries, the factories, the mills, and the offices. Here's some more from January 1915, quote, The truth of the matter is that the lawyers and detectives employed to save Leo Frank were themselves the authors of the hue and cry about his being a Jew, and they did it for the sordid purpose of influencing financial supplies, Wealthy Israelites all over the land have been appealed to, and their race pride aroused, in order that the lawyers and the detectives might have the use of unlimited funds. The propaganda in favor of Frank has been even more expensive than that in favor of Morse. The rich Jews of Athens, Atlanta, Baltimore, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, etc. have furnished the sinews of war. 
I dare say the campaign has not cost less than half a million dollars. The lawyers have probably been paid $100,000. The Burns Detective Agency has no doubt fingered $100,000. The publicity bills in the daily papers must be enormous, end quote. He goes on, quote, I venture to predict that when Frank's attorneys get through with their labors for this detestable sodomite, they will never again be what they were in health, standing, or practice. Leo Frank came down from New York to take charge of a factory where young Gentile girls worked for Hebrews at a wage scale of five or six dollars a week. Leo Frank was a typical young Jewish man of business who loves pleasure and runs after Gentile girls. Every student of sociology knows that the black man's lust after the white woman is not much fiercer than the lust of the licentious Jew for the Gentile. Leo Frank was reared in the environment of the gentleman friend, whose financial aid is necessary to the $5 a week girl. He lived many years in that atmosphere. He came in contact with the young women who are paid the $5 a week and who are expected to clothe themselves, find decent lodgings, and pay doctor's bills out of the regular wage of $5 a week. Leo Frank knew what this system meant to the girls. In fact, we all know what it means, but we don't like to say so. We prefer not to interrupt our bounties to Chinese charities or check our provisioning of Belgian derelicts. How gay a life Leo Frank led among the wage slaves of the North we do not know. But when he arrived in Atlanta, he seems to have kept the pace from the very beginning. To his rabbi, he was a model young man. To the girls in the factory, he was a cynical libertine. The type is familiar. If the seducer wore a badge as the policeman does, he would never seize his prey. If all the immoral men were to appear so, when they go to church, the hopeless minority of the virtuous might have to limit their devotional exercises to family prayer. End quote. All that's incredibly gross stuff, but I really think it's best to look such historical facts in the face. But I'm not here to disgust you. So I'll leave Watson B for now. On the other hand, the Pueblo Colorado Star Journal and others like them employed racism of a different sort to different ends. Quote, those who doubted the charges that Frank had been unfairly tried will change their opinion as a result of the mob vengeance visited upon him. The same spirit that caused his hanging undoubtedly was present during his trial and resulted in his conviction by jurors who feared for their own safety. If they cleared him of the charge of murdering a young girl in the pencil factory of which he was superintendent, the general opinion is that Frank was innocent of murder and should not have been convicted on the unsupported testimony of a worthless Negro. End quote. Picking back up with the wheels of justice, much of this was a miscarriage from the start, obviously though I'm no kind of lawyer. Inflammatory public opinion unduly influencing the jury, and several events and rulings in the courtroom should have, at the very least, I think, been grounds for a mistrial. There were also allegations of intimidation against the jury members that were credible. Nonetheless, after conviction, all appeals were denied at the state level and then the federal a commutation of Frank's death sentence was sought as a last resort, with the hope of exoneration via a new trial down the line, but this was denied by the parole board. Even though all these safeguards in our so-called justice system failed him, there was but one last hope. The governor of Georgia had the power to set aside convictions or commute sentences, and it was this mechanism that would determine the end of Leo Frank's tragic tale. Governor John Slayton, whose term as governor was to end just four days after the execution of Leo Frank, was under immense pressure both to act and not act. The judge in the murder trial, shortly before he died, wrote and begged the governor to correct his mistake, as he was not convinced of Frank's guilt. Atlanta's Jewish community and Jews around the nation, many of whom had raised enormous funds for Leo Frank's legal defense, begged the governor to commute or pardon Frank. 
On the other side, former Governor Joseph Brown warned Slayton that true lynch law would be reversing all that had occurred already and granting Frank a new trial. Emissaries of powerful men promised him career-long alliances and the chance to become the master of Georgia politics for the rest of his life, if only he would let Frank hang. He received thousands of death threats. Amidst this atmosphere, the governor dug into the evidence. And you know what? Damn. He concluded that there was actually a bunch of stuff that really should have been considered at trial that wasn't, and that Jim Conley was probably full of shit. So he commuted his sentence to life imprisonment and was confident that Frank would soon have the opportunity to prove his evidence in a new trial. Quote, All I ask is that the people of Georgia read my statement and consider calmly the reasons I have given for commuting Leo M. Frank's sentence. Feeling as I do about the case, I would be a murderer if I allowed that man to hang. I would rather be plowing in a field than to feel for the rest of my life that I had that man's blood on my hands. End quote. Now, John Slayton ain't really regarded as one of our better known characters of American history or even Georgian history, but he's about to become the first chief executive in American history, as far as I know, to declare martial law in order to save his own neck. A multitude of furious white people descended upon the governor's mansion and the National Guard had to be assembled, along with a bunch of Slayton's personal supporters sworn in quickly as temporary deputies. John Slayton left Georgia immediately after these events, and though he attempted to put a brave face on things and declared that he hadn't slipped away in the night or fled his constituents, that is more or less what he did. His action was considered by the mob to be political interference, and endless hay was made over the fact that he was a law partner in Frank's lead attorney's firm, though he had had nothing to do with the case. Slayton wouldn't come back to Georgia for ten years. Meanwhile, Leo Frank, still behind bars, was probably in even more danger than the governor, as he had no army or policemen to call upon in case of trouble. As Watson put it, quote, Our grand old empire state has been raped. Hereafter, let no man reproach the South with lynch law. Let him remember the provocation, and let him say whether lynch law is not better than no law at all. End quote. So Frank was rushed out to Milledgeville State Penitentiary the night before his commutation was announced. This prison only accessible via dirt road at the time and far from where he was being held in Marietta outside Atlanta. Yet an inmate while he was there still slashed his throat with a butcher knife all the same. His life was only saved by the quick actions of two other inmates who were doctors I've read. But two weeks after Watson declared Georgia raped and lynch law better than none, a couple dozen people decided that someone had to pay for all this, for the low wages and child labor and immigration and the destruction of pre-industrial ways of life and mores and culture and above all, just being a fucking Jew. And they took the law, such as they saw it, into their own hands. The former governor of Georgia, the former mayor of Marietta, and future president of the state senate of Georgia, the current mayor of Marietta, and several current and former sheriffs of Cobb County, Georgia, along with some car mechanics, an electrician, a locksmith, a medic, and a lay preacher, and several, several others, totaling at least 26 names we know, with a guess of about 40 people maximum involved, all conspired to kill Leo Frank. Around 10 p.m. on August 16, 1915, the men arrived and began systematically cutting telephone lines to the prison and draining gas from all the cars parked outside. They went inside the building, handcuffed the warden, grabbed Frank, and drove off. A few hours later, they assembled at the childhood home of Mary Fagan, where they asked Frank for his last request. He proclaimed his innocence to them for a final time, 
and asked that his murderers please return his wedding band to his wife. They did so, after they hung him from a tree by his neck until he was dead, for a murder he never committed. It was a seismic event, one that was well documented and publicized both negatively and positively nationwide, this lynching. Thousands of photographs were taken where the lynchers are clearly identifiable and visible. Yet no grand jury ever indicted anyone for the murder of Leo Frank. As a direct result of this killing, the Anti-Defamation League was formed to combat anti-Semitism in the United States. And it said about half of Georgia's Jewish population left. I suspect this is an exaggeration, as census data doesn't really show that, even if it also doesn't prove no one left. Without a doubt, though, many, many Jewish families left Georgia out of fear in the aftermath. In less than a year, Tom Watson's magazine had more than tripled in circulation. He would soon become a senator from Georgia after a couple tries, but die before assuming office. Hugh Dorsey, the prosecutor who had gotten Frank's original bullshit conviction, was rewarded with two terms as governor of Georgia. Just a few weeks after the lynching of Frank in 1915, William Joseph Simmons was getting ready for a big kickoff party at Stone Mountain, Georgia with a few of his friends, where he planned to read from the Bible and announce the establishment of a new Ku Klux Klan. This second clan, whose anti-Jewish and anti-Catholic viewpoints were also a huge piece of their pie, in addition to their anti-black ones, needed something like some celebrity endorsements to really take off. So naturally, several of the men who lynched Leo Frank, calling themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan, played this role. The state of Georgia finally issued a posthumous pardon for Leo Frank in the 1980s, based upon its failure to protect him while he was in their custody. The pardon noticeably did not absolve him of his crimes. Fights over this trial continue. In fact, starting around 2013, several websites, many still active, purporting to tell the real history of Leo Frank and Mary Fagan, began popping up. These sites are more or less rehashes of existing propaganda from the time and shoddy so-called evidence with varying degrees of slickness to their design, but some of them can actually be quite deceptive. You will rarely meet a neo-Nazi or Ku Klux Klan member who doesn't, uh, know the truth about the noble Tom Watson, the malicious Leo Frank, and the innocent little white girl Mary Fagan. And even outside circles like that, there are still plenty of people ready to argue Frank was guilty, including, tragically, some of Mary Fagan's relatives. Leo Frank did not kill Mary Fagan. Certainly the evidence that he did isn't good enough to satisfy reasonable doubt, that's for sure. And there are a few larger points to remark upon about all this. The first one being a bit basic, but nonetheless, I don't often hear it brought up. All of us, and by us I mean humanity, whatever our race or gender, skin color, whatever identities we possess, we are all capable of being assholes, of being murderers and liars, thieves and scoundrels, even exploitative bosses. All of us are equally capable of being these things. It was said quite openly at the time that Jim Conley was a simple man in large part because he was a black man, and he was far too stupid to make up any convoluted lies implicating Leo Frank. It might seem an absurd kind of progress, but it's progress all the same. That's a lie. Conley was smarter than that, and he did make up a bunch of convoluted lies implicating Leo Frank. All peoples of the earth, it turns out, are capable of employing cunning lies to save their own skins. This is also an important lesson in the essentialness of solidarity. The Jewish population of Atlanta, which largely faced only a few minor barriers in education, housing, and employment for decades, 
had worked incredibly hard to differentiate themselves from these new Jewish immigrants and were certainly not above prejudice against them or against the black community. Less than a decade before Leo Frank was lynched, Atlanta experienced one of the worst race riots in its history. As a white mob was ginned up to attack black people amidst a torrent of rumors and racism in 1906. Yet the Jews in Atlanta seemed safe enough at the time. When new Jewish immigrants began arriving in large numbers and anti-Semitic attitudes began taking a steady turn up, they were nearly as aware of the differences between themselves as established, liberal, and assimilated and these new poor Yiddish-speaking arrivals with a strange seeming religion as the Gentile population was and Atlanta's liberal Jews still seemed safe enough, all the same. But they weren't, not really, as the trial and lynching proves. And while it's important to appreciate the historical precariousness of their place in Atlanta and the larger United States around the turn of the century, it's a fact that their carefully cultivated plan to be Jewish, but not like those Jews over there, failed. Leo Frank was not a Yiddish-speaking Jew from the Russian Empire, living with ten other people and working for poverty wages. He was a Yankee Jew who had married into the local Jewish aristocracy whose family had established the first synagogue in Atlanta two generations ago. It was one of theirs ultimately killed for a crime he didn't commit. It turns out white supremacists are less careful and rigorous about differentiating between different kinds of Jews than one might hope. Undoubtedly, speaking out forcefully against the rank anti-Semitism of the time in a way that showed solidarity with these new immigrant peoples would have had consequences for the liberal establishment Jews of Atlanta. True. But not doing so did no one any favors in the end not for the German Jews of Atlanta, and not the new Jewish arrivals. We'd be wise to go a step further, I'd say. What if that solidarity was not just of a different degree, but a different kind? One that spanned across Jew and Gentile alike. One that focused upon the common experience of all who've experienced oppression and exploitation. It could still contain a healthy respect for tradition and identity, certainly, but would also more fully recognize the truth that a person's a person and that we all have worth. Imagine banishing this perpetual schizophrenia America seems to have, where we love the immigrant past but fear the immigrant present. Such a change could actually be a first step towards realizing that for that mass of people called normal, regular, unimportant, our commonness and our experience make us very much the same. We need not fight each other at all on the grounds of race or ethnicity or nationality or religion and might instead turn our gaze towards those cheering on such fighting as a way to keep us divided and powerless. Easy enough to say as a Gentile at the end of all this, I guess. For this story ends with a Jew lynched at the end of a years-long ordeal for a crime he didn't do. I can only recommend the words of one born in 1871 into a family of Polish Jews who was familiar enough with the anti-Semitism of the time. And yet she remarked, quote, What do you want with these special Jewish pains? I feel as close to the wretched victims of the rubber plantations in Putumayo and the blacks of Africa with whose bodies the Europeans play ball. I have no special corner in my heart for the ghetto. I am at home in the entire world where there are clouds and birds and human tears. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. I know I went a little longer than I usually do on these, but frankly, this episode just spoke to me in ways that I didn't expect. I wanted to learn more and more about it, say more and more about it. And while there's more I could say, probably, <laughs> that's enough for now. 
That's patreon.com slash distant peasant. One time donations go to paypal.me slash distant peasant. Headquarters is distantpeasant.com at Jeff His is my Twitter handle. I will see you.